Judge Schwebel, it is a great pleasure to welcome you to the Squire Law Library today. As you may know, I have recently interviewed several eminent legal academics associated with Cambridge University, and tributes to their careers have been compiled to build up a recent oral history of the law faculty. <coughs> we call this the Eminent Scholars Archive. Nearly 60 years ago, at the beginning of an illustrious legal and academic career, you first acquainted yourself with this library when you arrived from the United States to study law at Trinity College under Professor Hirsch Lauterpacht, then the Yule Professor. Of course, in those days, the Squire Library was in the old schools and in the centre of Cambridge, whereas today we sit in the Norman Foster modern creation on the West Road. In the intervening years, you have moved on a world stage and associated with many famous legal and political personalities, some of whom I hope you will introduce to us today. Also over those years, you have maintained strong links with Cambridge. It has been my practice to begin these interviews with a brief introduction by the scholars of their family background in early life, just to set the scene. Judge Schwebel, you were born in 1929. Yes, my brother used to say to me that uh, I precipitated the Great Depression. Uh, at any rate, I was uh, born in that portentous year uh, in Brooklyn, New York, uh, in a, a middle-class American family, uh, which uh, suffered the stresses of the Great Depression. Though I never knew it as a child, uh, my parents were very loving. My brother was an extraordinarily supportive brother then and has been so to this day. Uh, and I had a very happy uh, childhood. Um, I was an indifferent student in my younger years, which probably contributed to my popularity with my fellow students, but what didn't was that I was a hopeless athlete. Uh, whenever I was put on a school team, the other boys would groan, oh no, we don't want him. But I was very bookish, and I spent my childhood reading through my parents' library. And by the time I got to high school, secondary school, I had read a great deal. And I think that's what propelled me from being a um, mediocre elementary school teacher uh, to the top of my class in the public school to which I went. And as I neared graduation from that school when I was about to turn 17, uh, the United Nations was founded in its San Francisco conference. And I found that a uh, very gripping development. I had followed the, the war closely. My brother was in the uh, U.S. Army. Uh, but until then, I had not had any exceptional interest in international affairs, but I became fascinated with the founding of the United Nations and have remained very interested in, and broadly speaking, a supporter of the United Nations to this day. I wondered about that. Um, after leaving school, you were a student at Harvard College from 1946 to 1950. How did you pursue your United Nations interests while you were at Harvard? Well, I founded a student organization called the United Nations Council of Harvard. And there were United Nations councils in a great many American universities then. They aren't now. They've, they've died or they've merged with international relations clubs. But it's hard to imagine, indeed, today how prominent a place in American public perception and discourse the United Nations had. The New York Times are by far our finest newspaper. Some treat it as virtually a house organ of the UN. It ran so much every day uh, about the United Nations. 
just by happenstance, being active in the UN student movement, I met the new UN Secretary General and his family almost immediately. Uh, they arrived in the United States and became quite uh, friendly uh, with them, uh, with with Secretary General Trigvili, uh, uh, with his daughters, with his his lovely wife, and um, I was very active uh, both before Harvard and and during my years at Harvard, both in the UN student movement and the American Association for the United Nations. Today, it's called the United Nations. Association, very much like the British United Nations Association, though I think the British Association is, has been a more powerful body over the years, and certainly was in the League of Nations days, uh, than its uh, American equivalents. Jeff Schwebel, how did you, during this period, become acquainted with the work of Mrs. Roosevelt? Well, uh, Mrs. Roosevelt was a um, member of the board of directors of the American Association for the United Nations. And so I came to know her uh, as a member of that board. I was a member of the board representing the students um, from roughly 1946 to the early 1950s. And um, after her husband's death, Mrs. Roosevelt particularly devoted herself uh, to the United Nations uh, uh, and spent a, a lot of effort uh, in assisting uh, the uh, American Association for the UN. Well, she assisted in innumerable causes. She was a woman of uh, enormous uh, goodwill and human uh, empathy. I went with her on a uh, trip in 19... 57, I think it was, uh, to Russia. Uh, she was the chairman of a delegation of the American Association for the United Nations um, visiting the Soviet equivalent. Uh, and it would, that was a very interesting experience. Um, there were others on the delegation of some note, like Paul Huffman, who'd been the former uh, head of the uh, Marshall Plan uh, in Europe. Uh, and it was a very interesting uh, experience. But uh, Mrs. Roper was no one who I came to know well. I, I, I met her on quite a number of occasions, and, but I, I was by no means an intimate person. After Harvard, you began your association with Cambridge in 1950 when you came to study under Professor Hirsch Nautipacht. What were the circumstances of your coming across? Well, Harvard was good enough to uh, give me a fellowship, the Frank Knox Memorial Fellowship, uh, which the widow of Frank Knox had set up, uh, Knox having been the Secretary of the Navy during the war, a, a leading Republican, uh, a man of considerable means. Uh, and his wife set up uh, these fellowships, which are going to this day, tenable at any university in the British Commonwealth. Uh, and uh, I decided to apply for Cambridge because of the fame of the then Yule professor, uh, Hirsch Lauterbach, which was uh, imposing. He was widely regarded as the leading public international lawyer in the world at that time. Uh, and um, I applied for Trinity College simply because an Englishman that I knew in my house at Harvard said, that's the one you should apply to. I knew nothing about the colleges at Cambridge. And I was accepted and um, uh, arrived, and when you were speaking of the Squire Law Library, I thought of the first time I entered it, because that was on October 1 or 2, 1950, and I went straight away to see Professor Lauderpark, I think before I'd even been installed in my rooms, I can't think why, but I did, uh, because I remember going into his office, you know, a tiny office in the Squire, I mean, about a quarter of the size of this room. It had hardly admitted more than 
uh, a uh, desk and his chair and a chair for his guests. That was it. He didn't do his work there. He did his scholarly work at home. Uh, but he received students there. And um, I turned up still encrusted with the salt of a channel crossing because it had been a very rough crossing. And as I was going in the door, uh, a tall spare man was coming out and um, Professor Lauterbach introduced Captain Baxter. Uh, and uh, as I sat down, he said, such a nice man, that. And I said, of the British Army. And he said, no, no, of the American Army. And that was Dick Baxter, uh, who later became a professor at Harvard Law School and who uh, uh, later became a judge of the International Court of Justice and would have had a very distinguished career there, but for the tragedy of his dying after 19 months of office uh, of a, a blood cancer. And he and I became great friends in the course of that year, which was a very formative year in my life because uh, first I determined uh, uh, under the stimulus of Professor Lado Hoch to pursue international law as a career. Uh, and I learned a great deal from him and remained very close to him until his death. And he, he showered me with countless kindnesses. And second, he um, very shrewdly perceived that at the outset I needed uh, uh, close and good mentoring and he selected his son Ellie to be my tutor. And I was Ellie's first tutee. Ellie was then in London. He'd just gone down from Cambridge the previous year. Uh, and he was working at the bar. Uh, but he uh, was beginning to teach, and he soon became a fellow of Trinity College. And when he would come up every week or two to Cambridge, he would uh, tutor me. And uh, those were very enjoyable sessions. I mean, we mainly talked about girls and things like that, but occasionally some law crept in. And you've maintained a lifetime friendship with him? Uh, a lifetime friendship, and I have just had lunch with him today. And, um, uh, he, he has been my uh, closest friend for, well, it's, uh, I'm approaching 60 years now. Judge Schwebel, you were at Trinity College. How did you find life there in post-war England compared to the United States? Well, I was fascinated with Trinity College. It was very, very different from Harvard. If you sat at a table for a meal, the chap next to you uh, would begin a conversation by saying, what game do you play? Not what are you reading, uh, what's brought you here, but what game do you play? And since I played no game, uh, I was a, a bit out of it. Uh, and apparently uh, most of the students played a game and after they'd become good at the game, switched to another game. Uh, uh, this was quite uh, surprising uh, to me. I, also, the students didn't seem to study all that much. They spent an awful lot of time talking um, at coffee, at tea, uh, drinks after dinner, um, it may be that many of them worked hard and just were quiet about it because uh, Englishmen don't toot their own horn. You see, they're very different from Americans in this. I mean, in England it's considered ill-mannered to uh, tell people of your accomplishments, potential, and all you're doing. Not at all so in America where people tend to be rather boastful and forward and... Uh, selling themselves at every possible opportunity. So, they're very different mannerisms. And I found these English mannerisms very engaging. I, I liked liked England, and I think England liked me. We, we got on very well. Of course, I was cold, and the food was miserable. But everybody uh, was eating the same miserable food, and um, it wasn't particularly unhealthy. It just was not very palatable. Uh, and the, the college itself uh, maintained a, a, a certain magnificence. I mean, the, the waiters were all dressed in tails and were very mannerly. Uh, and there was a wonderful wine list, if you were interested in that. Uh, and at the end of the meal, they'd always say, sweet or savory, sir. 
uh, and uh, one was more repellent than the next. I mean, the, uh, the, the savory would would be a uh, sad sardine on a piece of the damp toast, and the, the sweet would be uh, uh, some sort of slop on, on gruel, uh, and the food was not much, but um, the university was bursting with uh, vitality, intelligence, uh, animation. There were an ending stream of interesting lectures, uh, a great many interesting people. It was a very lively undergraduate theatre and, and so on. So I, I thought Cambridge was marvellous and, uh, and liked it hugely. Uh, and um, between uh, my um, uh, affection for Professor Lauderpacht and all I learned from him and from uh, Ellie uh, and from other friends I made there, uh, at Cambridge uh, it was a very meaningful year. For me, one of my great friends from that time uh, um, still is Professor Jalowicz. He was a student in Trinity at that time. I remember Ellie saying to me, oh, there's only one fellow worthwhile at Cambridge and got Trinity to you and get another. It's Tony Jalowicz. Nobody else booked or bothered. But that, that sort of uh, talk, you know, which one wouldn't take very seriously, but he was right that Tony Jalowicz was very worthwhile. And he's been a lifelong friend as well as is his wife. Professor Jolovitz is one of our eminent scholars as well. Yes. As is Sir Derek Bowett, who is a friend yes. of yours. Do you remember yes. him? Derek, I have uh, very warm memories of. Derek uh, uh, was a student, uh, together with Dick Baxter and myself, uh, of um, Professor Lauterpark uh, uh, during that time. Uh, Bowett uh, is a great fellow, was a great fellow. Uh, uh, he... Um, was a self-made uh, uh, Englishman, uh, totally unpretentious, very amusing, and a delightful uh, sense of humor, uh, extremely able, uh, industrious. He, too, was immensely influenced by Professor Lauderpark. He never thought, he told me, of an academic career uh, until uh, Hirsch Lauderpark suggested it. Uh, and that moved him into an academic career. He went up to Manchester to teach, then he came down here to teach. Uh, and uh, before one knew it, uh, he was the master or president, I'm not sure what it's called, of Queen's College at quite a young age because he so impressed his fellow fellows that he was uh, elected uh, to the mastership of Queen's and he became the Hewlett Professor. Uh, and um, uh, wrote a great deal of excellent stuff in the field uh, and was a very uh, frequent uh, advocate before the International Court of Justice as Elie Lauterbach uh, uh, was and continues to be and as the current uh, Yule Professor James Crawford is. I visit Derek from time to time and I shall be seeing him in about a week or so's time. Give him my warm regards, I'd be please. Very pleased to do that. I, I have very fond feelings for Derek Bard. He's a, he, he's a wonderful chap. Very impressive. Judge Schwebel, do you remember from that time Clive Perry at all? Yes, I remember Clive very well. Clive um, was one of the uh, three principal teachers of public international law, Professor Lauterbach being the primary one. Uh, Professor Jennings being the next one, and Jennings uh, taught the courses on the history of international law, principally. Uh, and then Parry uh, taught uh, a s seminar or two in various current aspects of international law. Parry was a very charming uh, man, um, exceedingly good-looking, he, uh, many people would mistake him for the Prince of Wales. He, uh, he very much looked like him. Uh, he was quite a, a dashing man in his appearance. He was a, a, a very English in his manner, uh, quite amusing and droll. He had, he had a, a lot of imagination, uh, a, a great deal of charm. Uh, he, 
he, I wouldn't say he was as a gripping uh, a lecturer as Elie Lauerbach was, for example. When Elie began to teach here, he was an absolutely marvelous lecturer. Um, uh, but uh, Parry uh, was very devoted to his students. He was full of ideas. Uh, a man of very considerable attainments. Alas, he died too young, too. He died in 83, I think it was. So that's quite a while ago now. After Cambridge, you went on a lecturing tour to India. What made you go to India? Well, before I, 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 I launched on that, I went to Yale Law School because I, uh, Professor Lauter Park impressed upon me that you couldn't be an international lawyer until you were a lawyer. And I had to get a proper law degree. Uh, and I uh, therefore went to Yale Law School. Uh, while I was at Yale, um, Yale gave me a terms credit, a half year's credit for my year at Cambridge. And so I had uh, uh, that sort of spare half year uh, available. Uh, I remained active uh, all that time in the UN student movement. And I had become the, at one stage, the president of the World Federation of United Nations Student Associations. And it was having its congress uh, in India in the fall of 52. Uh, and uh, I was no longer the president, uh, but uh, I was earnestly petitioned to try to get to that conference, and I was interested in going. But I didn't have financial means to go. And I um, put it up to the executive director of the American Association for the United Nations, who was uh, by then a, a good friend, Clark Eichelberger, his name was. And while I was sitting in his office, he called up the assistant Secretary of State for International Organization Affairs and uh, said this conference was going to take place and it was in the um, U.S. Uh, interest that um, uh, I be able to go and could the State Department figure out a way in which it could send me uh, since the American Association for the UN didn't have the money. Pay, who would pay the freight, I remember, was the phrase that Mr. Eichelberger used and he, uh, a short time later I got back word from the State Department saying we don't have funds that we can allot to send you to this meeting but we do have a program of presenting uh, Americans uh, as speakers at uh, Indian universities and civic groups uh, and the people we send generally are people of uh, a certain age and attainment, but we'd like to try out the idea of sending a student who uh, could travel to more remote parts of India uh, and talk to students, and if you're willing to spend three months doing that, then we'll pay you in India. So I said, you've, you've got a deal, I'd love to do that. And I spent uh, a bit over three months in India, and that was a fascinating experience for me, because first it was the my entry into the developing world. And second, I saw a great deal of India. I did go to some very remote places uh, off the beaten track, certainly far off the tourist track. I gave about a hundred speeches in India. I had three set speeches and I gave one or the other depending on uh, who the audience was. Most of them were uh, Indian university audiences. There were occasional uh, other ones. Um, I traveled by uh, train, uh, by by car, by um, occasional uh, air flights. Um, I think I traveled some 11 or 12,000 miles just in India in a period of three months and um, had a great time and um, made Indian friends, a few of whom I uh, maintain to this day. 
It must have been fascinating in the aftermath of independence as well. It was quite fascinating. In those days, actually, uh, English was still very widespread in India. Uh, it, it may be still, uh, but in those days there was a great effort to foster Hindi as the national language. I don't think this ever really caught on as a national language, but uh, uh, until uh, the end of the uh, empire, a great deal of teaching had been done in English, uh, certainly in the universities, but even in lesser uh, levels of education. And in 1952, the effects of that still persisted, so that I had the impression that, on the whole, I was pretty well understood by my audiences. Uh, and they cert there certainly was no lack of questions. I mean, the Indians are very talkative. Mm -hmm. I, I would start receiving callers at something like 6 a.m. in the morning. People would come knocking on my door, not to ask about nuclear tests or allegations of germ warfare in Korea, but questions like, uh, how can I get a scholarship to America? Uh, how much money does your father make? And things like that. Uh, uh, rather folksy uh, uh, questions. Uh, the Indians aren't at all shy. Uh, they're, they're very open about what they, uh, they ask about. And uh, uh, if they have... Um, a great interest uh, in the spiritual side of life, I never noticed it. <laughs> uh, did, did you meet, as he then was, uh, Nagendra Singh during this period? At all? No, uh, I, no, no, it's interesting you mention Nagendra Singh because Nagendra Singh was Ellie's other uh, initial 2T, perhaps his second. Uh, uh, a charming man uh, who um, later became president of the International Court of Justice, as I did. Uh, and we both served on the court together, and we were good friends. Uh, and indeed, he invited my wife and me uh, out to India. To, uh, he arranged for the bestowal of an honorary degree on me. That was the occasion for it. And when he told me the law school that was to give me an honorary degree, I said, that's very fitting. And he said, why is it fitting? And I said, because Bhopal Law School has never heard of me, and I've never heard of it. <laughs> I, 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 Bhopal lady became uh, famous, alas, because of that appalling uh, accident in which so many people uh, lost their lives or were injured, but it wasn't as well known to the outside world at the time that I went there for the receipt of an honorary degree. At any rate, I did go back to India then, and, and I had a, another occasion or two, uh, and much enjoyed it. Uh, and the gender Singh was an exceptionally uh, a congenial and jovial uh, man, a very warm-hearted uh, person, who actually died during his service on the court. In 1954, Judge Swable you joined the firm of attorneys White and Case. Yes. You stayed with them for about five years. Yes. Uh, when I got out of law school, I um, went to look for a job. Uh, and that was a period of downturn. I wouldn't say anything like as an acute a recession as currently is gripping the United States. But it wasn't a boom time either. And um, a number of my classmates and I uh, didn't find getting a job easy. And in particular, uh, I was confronted by the reaction, well, you've uh, been an active young fellow, and we see you've written a book which is well-reviewed, and you know a lot about the UN and international law. Uh, but, but we don't do that. I mean, we're, we're just private practitioners. We won't have anything here that will uh, interest you. Uh, why don't you go work for the UN? That was the reaction I, I got. I interviewed at about 15 law firms, and uh, none of them seemed interested. Uh, finally, I went to White and Case, uh, and one of the interviewing partners asked me, did I know a certain hotel magnet, 
But in point of fact, I did know him because he was a member of the board of the American Association for the United Nations. And quite immediately after that, I got an offer from White and Case. Now, I don't know this. I never asked the man in question. But my guess is that that partner of White and Case called up this gentleman whom he knew and asked him if he'd recommend me uh, as an associate of White and Case, and that man doubtless did, and I was hired by White and Case. I, I, I believe that's the origin of it, but I, I'm not really sure. At any rate, I was very lucky in that, because uh, I, just about the time I began at White and Case, uh, they came to it one of the largest and most important and interesting international arbitrations of the 20th century, uh, that between the Arabian American Oil Company, Aramco, and the royal government of Saudi Arabia. The actual protagonists were on the one side Aramco and on the other side Aristotle, Socrates, and Assis, uh, who had concluded a contract with the king of Saudi Arabia, which gave Onassis's shipping empire a monopoly over the shipment of all oil from Saudi Arabia. Aramco had a concession agreement entered into in 1933, which was to run out, I believe, in 1999, which gave it the exclusive right to ship its oil or the oil it found in Saudi Arabia, abroad. And so it claimed that this contract of analysis with the king was in breach of its rights. Saudi Arabia, to its credit, agreed to submit that issue to an arbitration tribunal. The contract, the concession contract itself, provided for arbitration of disputes arising under it, very much in the model of the uh, concession contract of the uh, uh, Anglo-Iranian Oil Company or its uh, predecessor uh, and uh, other uh, British companies of that time. And so that arbitration took place and um, I was the, found myself the bottom man on a towering totem pole of international legal talent that uh, Aramco assembled. Uh, at the very top was Lord McNair, uh, formerly of this university, uh, who had uh, recently retired as president of the International Court of Justice. Uh, he had been the U professor here at Cambridge before Lauterpacht, uh, and um, was a very great figure in the world of international law. Uh, and there were several others who were almost equally eminent from various countries. Uh, but somebody had to dig through the files and prepare the basic briefs. And that fell to me. And I had an office at Aramco for years. I uh, learned a great deal about the international oil industry in general, and Aramco in particular, and Saudi Arabia, incidentally. Uh, and um, had a very uh, interesting time in the course of working uh, on that uh, arbitration. <coughs> and um, that uh, triggered a, an interest which has remained with me to this day uh, in international uh, arbitration, particularly in energy matters, but in other matters as well. I wondered about that. You mentioned that when you were taken on at White & Case, you had already published a work and that was the memoirs of Trichalvin D, his memoirs in the cause of peace. No, not quite. When I had published, uh, or had been published by the Harvard University Press, was my honors thesis that I'd written uh, as a senior uh, in Harvard College. Uh, uh, to get a degree at Harvard College with honors, not just the ordinary degree, but a degree cum laude, magna cum laude, or summa cum laude, one must um, do a thesis in the field of one's concentration. 
uh, my concentration field was government, uh, and uh, I chose to write on the office of the Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, well, partially because I knew the first Secretary General and his family. Uh, I had spent a summer working as an intern in the UN intern program in the office of the Secretary General. Uh, and by that time I had decided to do my thesis on that topic and I was able to gather a lot of information. And no one had written on the subject before. There had been books. Well, not really books, but there had been some writing on the Secretary General of the League of Nations. Not much. Uh, there had been a quite solid book on the Secretariat uh, of the League of Nations. Uh, but so far, virtually nothing had appeared on the Secretary General of the UN, the organization that only went in existence for three years by the time I undertook this. At any rate, I wrote my honors thesis uh, on that, and it was uh, well received. Now, Trigvili, the first Secretary General, served from 1946 to 1953 when he resigned. He resigned because he had a great breach with the Soviet Union over uh, his support of the UN reaction to the invasion of the Republic of Korea uh, by North Korea. To this day, North Korea remains uh, a, a belligerent, uh, uh, a very odd uh, government, and it was then, uh, and... Um, He was extended in office over Soviet opposition, uh, resigned after a few years. And when I was back at Yale, I received a call one day uh, from his secretary asking if I could come to have lunch with him at his home the following Sunday. And so I went down from New Haven out to his home in Forest Hills, New York. Uh, and he said that um, he had decided to write his memoirs, that he'd had a flood of offers from various publishers, uh, and he'd like me to help him do it. So I said, well, I'd, I'd be glad to do that. Uh, and he said, oh, well, uh, can you do it in a year? And I said, I, I don't know how long it'll take, but I had to say, Mr. Secretary General, I don't have a year. He said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I'm in the midst of my studies. I've just returned from India where I took a term off, uh, and I want to complete my law degree. I haven't got a year to take off. Well, he was rather disappointed in that, and I thought he, he found that a quite inadequate response. But he said, well, I'll have to get somebody else then. But in the meantime would you please produce an outline of the book that I can send to the publisher because I've had these uh, invitations. So I said, certainly. So he sat me down at his dining room table and, and passed me a typewriter uh, and I produced an outline of what I thought uh, the book uh, should be composed of, uh, which was obvious enough, you know, how he came to be Secretary General, the various crises he was confronted with uh, over the years. And he was pleased with that, he, and he did enter into a contract uh, quite quickly, a very favorable contract with Macmillan. Um, and um, then if, after a month or two went by, I heard nothing further from him. I really wasn't expecting to. And, and he called me up again and he said, listen, uh, how much time can you give me? So I said, I can give you the summer. Uh, and he said, okay, let's do, try it for the summer. We'll try to finish it. Uh, in the summer. And so uh, the day after my class was finished at uh, Yale uh, in that spring of 53, I flew over to Oslo, to which he had returned by that time. Uh, and um, he had uh, rented an apartment quite apart from his home where he thought we could work and hire the secretary. And we thrashed around for two or three weeks rather uselessly in Oslo while he'd go off to lunch with the king and so on. And, so on. Uh, and it wasn't going very well. And he said, 
we better go up to my country place where we'll have no disturbance. And I said, fine. And so we went in a caravan of cars up to a magnificent house that he'd been presented with on his 50th birthday by his uh, former colleagues in Norway. Lovely place in a very attractive part of Norway. Uh, and then, I guess in a period of about two months, uh, I drafted what later appeared as his memoirs called In the Cause of Peace. Um, and we worked this way, that uh, and following the outline that I'd done originally, um, I would read his the files that he brought, his personal files and official files, he had quite a collection, on, say, Korea, the invasion of Korea, the UN reaction to it. I would um, make an outline of the chapter and of the points that weren't clear to me from uh, the correspondence and the uh, official files, and I would ask him questions and he would respond. And then I'd prepare a draft and show him the draft, and he would say, well, <laughs> he likes this, likes that, that isn't quite right, I wouldn't put it that way, you don't quite understand that, that kind of thing. And I would rewrite the chapter. And uh, we um, boiled away on that for two months. Uh, I would say something like uh, ten hours a day, seven days a week. And we got the whole book done uh, in that period, except for the uh, introductory chapter, which he largely worked on with uh, uh, another uh, aide, uh, which were uh, about his personal background and how he became to be asked to be Secretary General, and then the concluding chapter of Future Ideas, which was written later in in New York. But uh, in all, he was quite happy with it. Macmillan sent over a uh, an editor uh, who came at the end of August and was very pleased with what he read. Uh, and uh, that was that. And um, uh, I think the, the memoirs were well received. And he was... He was content with that. And it was an interesting experience. It must have been very interesting coming so early in your career as well. Yes, yeah, so I was then uh, 23 or 24 years old. And, um, and, uh, and he and I got on uh, really quite well. Um, we, were, we were rather uh, uh, friendly. He was then, I mean, uh, he, he seemed to me... Uh, uh, relatively old, but as I look back at it, he, he was then 57. He was not an old man. I remember 57 because while we were there, a huge box came from Heinz, the manufacturer of ketchup and so on. <coughs> 57 varieties. And they had a practice of sending famous people uh, their 57 varieties on their 57th <laughs> birthday. And that much enlivened our diet in the course of that summer, which principally consisted of fish that we used to fish out of the pond, which was teeming with trout, except I was a, not a very successful fisherman. But he was excellent, and uh, others that he had staying with us were very good. Sounds wonderful. Judge Schwebel, you, from 1959 to 61, were an assistant professor at Harvard Law School. This was after you left White in the case. Right. What made you decide to leave the practice of law? Well, uh, I had never intended, I think, uh, when I was a student to become a legal practitioner. But I found that when I did it, it interested me a lot. It interested me more than law school did, for that matter. Many things that I found quite dry in law school sprang to life when I actually dealt with them as a, uh, an, an associate in the litigation wing of White and Case's New York office. And in fact, the New York office, that was the only office at that time that White and Case had. Now it has offices all over the world. And if someone walked into White and Case today and said they were interested in international law, they wouldn't be received as I was in those days I think, what's that? We don't do it uh, because law firms do quite a lot now um, well 
I liked practice, uh, but uh, Harvard Law School then was in the process of building upon its uh, eminent status in the field of international law, which it had for a long time. Uh, uh, it, it had a director of international legal studies, Milton Katz, a man of great dynamism, elegance, and charm, who um, uh, had uh, taken leave from Harvard to become uh, head of the Marshall Plan in Europe, and after that was uh, one of the founding uh, members of the Ford Foundation. And when he went back to Harvard to teach, he brought in a lot of money from the Ford Foundation with him uh, in pursuance of an, a, an enhanced program of international legal studies at Harvard Law School, but also in a number of other law schools in the United States. And as a matter of fact, the Ford Foundation, uh, at that juncture, uh, and I, I played a modest role in this, um, gave a, a grant to international law reports, which was produced here in Cambridge. Uh, Professor Lauderpacht had written me that uh, they were in financial difficulties and could I see about trying to raise some uh, money and approach the Ford Foundation, which had turned them down. Well, just by a stroke of luck, a friend of mine I happened to be working then uh, as Henry Ford's personal assistant for Nun Automobile Mattis. Uh, and I got on to him about this, and he was able to turn that around and get a grant from the Ford Foundation to International Law Reports, which was significant in its uh, for the time. I mean, nowadays it doesn't sound like much money, but in, in those days it was a significant injection of funds. At any rate, I, I'm digressing. Uh, uh, Harvard Law School gave me an invitation which I thought uh, was directed towards my teaching in the international area because that was really the only reason for them to invite me up there. I had, if I had any attainments that were generally speaking in the field of teaching the law. Uh, but when I got there I found that indeed I, I, I did teach the, the basic course in international law with Dick Baxter, my old pal from from Cambridge, and that was great. We had a lot of fun with that. I also taught a seminar in international investment problems, legal problems of international investment, on which I had worked with the Anasis case and others. But the principal duty with which I was charged was teaching a course in commercial law, which was a required course in the law school. I had one-third of the second year class so I had uh, several hundred students teaching sales, secure transactions, bankruptcy, uh, negotiable instruments, uh, and other complexities, most of which I had never studied at Yale Law School, and none of which I dealt with in practice. Uh, and I was by then five years out of law school. Uh, I would say there was a very substantial percentage of the class that was natively smaller than I was, and an even higher percentage that was more interested in the subject than I was. So I found this a very daunting chore. And it was hard on the students because the other two sections of, of this fundamental course were taught by towering experts in the field. One of them had uh, been a principal author of the Uni Uniform Commercial Code, which was the uh, primary code dealing with these subjects, which had recently replaced various Uniform Sales Acts of the uh, then 48 or 50 states. Um, so I, I found this a very trying experience, really. Uh, I think Harvard made a mistake. Uh, in asking me to teach that rather than teach for my strengths. Uh, and um, I think that's what, uh, in fact, led me away from pursuing an academic career because uh, just at that time, uh, Kennedy was elected as president. Uh, and uh, there was an exodus of the Harvard faculty to Washington in support of his administration because he was a Massachusetts senator, he was a Harvard graduate as was his father and his brothers 
Uh, he had a lot of friends in the Harvard faculty and a lot of supporters. Now, I wasn't one of them. First of all, I was much too junior. And second, I was not a supporter of Kennedy. I was a supporter of Adlai Stevenson. And I, I, I didn't think Kennedy was all that uh, well suited to displace Stevenson as the presidential candidate. But one of my friends on the faculty, uh, Abe Shades, was very close to Kennedy. Uh, and uh, when Kennedy was elected, he was offered more or less whatever he wanted in the administration. And he said, I'd like to be legal advisor of the State Department. That greatly surprised people because he had had nothing to do with international law before. But he got the job. And then he said to me before going down to Washington, by the way, would you like to come with me? And I said, to do what? And he said, well, I'll look into that. And tell me what you're interested in. And I said, well, you had affairs. So he offered me the post of Assistant Legal Advisor for United Nations Affairs, and I resigned from Harvard and took it. And I never regretted that, actually, uh, because that was an era when the United Nations still was central to American foreign policy, and Governor Stevenson was appointed the American ambassador to the UN. And in the position to which I was appointed, I was his legal advisor. Uh, both to the Secretary of State on UN Affairs, but also to Ambassador Stevenson. I spent months a year in New York with him. So I found that a very challenging, interesting time uh, and enjoyed it hugely. And that was my first entry into the International Court of Justice because uh, the uh, UN General Assembly sought an advisory opinion of the World Court uh, in 1962, I think it was, uh, on certain expenses of the United Nations. Uh, the Soviet bloc in France weren't paying their assessments for peacekeeping. Uh, in those days, the United States, it's changed since, was uh, the great advocate of the United Nations and for all states paying their assessments when due in full. Uh, and um, I was the sort of point man on that uh, policy, certainly the legal aspects, and wrote the, the briefs on it. Uh, and um, Shays and I took that case to the court. Uh, and that was a, a very interesting uh, experience. Uh, it came out as we wished, uh, and the court upheld the v validity of these UN assessments, which were challenged. It was the first time that Russia had ever spoken on the court and sent its legal advisor to challenge the assessments, and did France. Uh, but the majority held as we thought they should hold. And then there was a great battle in the General Assembly as to whether to enforce that judgment. And that battle was lost. The uh, um, General Assembly uh, lost its nerve. It, it, it was uh, frightened by threats of the Soviet Union and of France, that if they lost their vote the General Assembly, they'd walk out. Uh, and so um, uh, the whole effort collapsed. Uh, and the UN, I think, has never recovered financially from that. And I think that led uh, very much to the policy of default on the part of the United States in later years. The attitude of Congress was, well, if the others don't pay, then why should we pay, you see? Uh, this has uh, bedeviled the UN ever since. Very interesting, Judge Schwebel. So that was your involvement with Article 19? Exactly, exactly. That was Article 19. Uh, and I, uh, uh, in my uh, collection of articles on uh, justice and international law, the memorandum that I wrote as assistant legal advisor on Article 19 is published. That's the only thing in that volume uh, that was an official paper uh, at one time. Uh, and um, I think legally uh, it was cogent, uh, whether it made as much political sense as we thought at the time is open to question, I guess, certainly in the light of events as they developed. That was also related to your, the topic of the permanent sovereignty. Yes, um, yes, uh, that went uh, at that stage rather more happily. Uh, in 
62 or 3, uh, the British uh, assistant legal advisor uh, of the day uh, and I uh, negotiated uh, a resolution with the developing countries led by a newly elected UN member, Algeria, uh, on the question of permanent sovereignty over natural resources. Chile had proposed that that topic be considered by the UN Economic and Social Council. It set up a committee which considered it for some years. It came up with a draft resolution which attempted to codify essentially the international law governing foreign investment in, of, in long -term, of a long-term kind of natural resources. Uh, and um, uh, that resolution was of intense interest and concern to uh, capital exporting states like the United Kingdom and the United States uh, and to the great companies that made these investments. Uh, and um, the negotiation was a very intense one. And uh, in the end, um, the General Assembly adopted a resolution uh, which was, considering what had gone before, and even more considering what came after, uh, remarkably balanced. Uh, because while it recognized, on the one hand, that every state has permanent sovereignty over its own natural resources, it also recognized that it must exercise that sovereignty in accordance with any pertinent international legal obligations, either resulting from customary international law or from the particularities of treaties or contracts into which it might have entered. Uh, and uh, it provided, for example, quite remarkably for that day, uh, that states uh, are bound to respect agreements between them and by them, by them meaning between them and other non-state entities such as companies. Uh, the Soviet bloc bitterly opposed this resolution and described it as a sellout to capitalism. Uh, and a few other countries abstained, but the vast majority were brought along to support this. But uh, that um, a triumph was not sustained because uh, as the years passed, successive resolutions under the same title of permanent sovereignty over natural resources uh, became more and more one-sided uh, and um, asserted the total dominance of national law and the exclusion of international law uh, in the treatment and taking of foreign investment. And that culminated in the adoption in 1974 of the so-called Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States, which is a UN resolution proposed by Mexico and other developing states, uh, which is in the same, what I would judge, extremist trend of claiming that a state can treat foreign investment as it likes, uh, and certainly no better than it treats its own. Uh, national investors, however badly it treats them. And by that time I had returned to the State Department. I was the chairman of the U.S. delegation uh, trying to negotiate that charter of economic rights and duties of states. Um, I, I, I led the delegation in a succession of conferences which culminated uh, in Mexico City in a very contentious meeting so contentious uh, that the uh, foreign minister of Mexico uh, called the then Secretary of State, uh, Henry Kissinger, to demand that I be recalled, uh, which was uh, rather presumptuous. Uh, I'm not aware that the United States calls the foreign minister of uh, foreign states to demand the recall of their representatives because he follows a policy that's not congenial. 
But at any rate, uh, that's what the Mexican foreign minister did. Uh, and the uh, then Under Secretary of State uh, came down to Mexico City to see what the problem was. Uh, and um, the Mexican foreign minister, in my presence and his, uh, said to him three times that uh, I should be recalled and replaced by someone who would take uh, a more open minded attitude towards Mexico's proposals, and each time uh, the Undersecretary proceeded to discuss the substance of the matter as if he hadn't heard what the Mexican Foreign Minister said. Uh, and finally, uh, the Undersecretary very sharply engaged the Mexican Foreign Minister on the substance of it, uh, more sharply than I had in public, <coughs> whereupon I think the Mexican Foreign Minister concluded that he'd better keep quiet and that he might even get someone worse than I was if I were replaced. I heard no more of that. Uh, at any rate, uh, the United States and the most of the industrialized democracies voted against that charter. Uh, and that was, in a sense, the end of efforts uh, in the UN to write a uh, worldwide code that would govern these matters. There have been some efforts since, but they've never gotten very far. And uh, things have veered off in another and much healthier direction uh, by in which states conclude so-called bilateral investment treaties, uh, which govern these matters. And there are now some 2,800 of these treaties, two-thirds of which are enforced by states of every continent, political outlook, economic uh, disposition. Uh, and uh, these, I think, are very progressive treaties uh, which promote the flow of foreign investment and afford the investor the right to direct arbitral recourse against the state, if needs be. Fascinating, Judge Raymond. Before your involvement with the Charter of Economic Rights and Duties of States in your capacity as Counselor to the State Department, you went back to academia for That's a time. Right. You were the Berlin Professor of International Law at John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies in Washington. Why did you go back to teaching? Well, why did I go back to teaching? Well, again, as it was one of these happenstances of of life, I'd had a very happy time as the assistant legal advisor for UN Affairs, uh, but I'd done that for a while. Um, the um, legal advisor of the State Department uh, left uh, after President Kenny Kennedy's uh, assassination. Uh, I no longer uh, found the leadership of the Office of the Legal Advisor as congenial as I had before. Uh, so I accepted an invitation to join the Bureau of International Organization Affairs, which I did for a year, and did work of considerable interest, particularly in negotiating a treaty with Japan over Micronesian war claims. And while I was doing that, I received an invitation from Johns Hopkins University to teach there, and at the same time an invitation by the American Society of International Law to serve as its executive director, and that was a joint appointment between the two. And uh, that was attractive to me at the, at the time, uh, and um, so I accepted that offer and did that for six, six or seven years. But then I, uh, I went back to government because I found that uh, I missed the excitement of government work. Uh, I think for a public international lawyer, uh, there's really nothing to match uh, being in the legal office uh, of a government that is active in these matters because you get a constant stream of fascinating problems to deal with and you have a sense 
of being a participant in molding the law. So I went back first as counselor on international law, which is a position that turns over in the State Department legal office. Normally a, a different academic occupies the place for a year or two. And then I was appointed a deputy legal advisor, and I found myself then back on problems that I dealt with in my days at White and Case in Aramco, the international oil crisis. That was in 73 when uh, OPEC repudiated the oil concessions, uh, imposed a vast increase in the price of oil, uh, uh, the Yom Kippur War and all of that. Uh, and so I had a very interesting time dealing with those uh, uh, problems. During uh, the turbulence of Jimmy Carter's years. Pardon? During the turbulence of Jimmy Carter's years. Yes, uh, in, 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 in the years of President Carter. And um, I, I, I enjoyed that uh, uh, very much um, and stayed there until I was nominated for election to the court. Uh, now, if things had gone as they should have gone, uh, Dick Baxter would have occupied that seat on the court uh, for almost another eight years. Uh, but uh, the tragedy was that uh, within a year of his election, he, who had always seemed to be around an eminent good health, and abstemious habits, and so forth, uh, was stricken uh, with a dreadful uh, blood cancer and uh, died within four months, I guess, of his illness. Now, um, the statute of the International Court prescribes that in making nominations for the court, the, the national groups that make the nomination these groups are composed of nominees of the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the various parties to the um, statute of the court, shall consult with legal faculties, uh, their uh, highest courts, and so on. In most countries, this isn't done. It's recommended, but it isn't required, and it's simply not done. But in the United States, it is done and has been done at any rate the last 50 or 60 years. And so that process was uh, launched again. It had been launched when Baxter had been nominated a few years before and, uh, and in a uh, contest before that. And it wasn't when he died. Uh, and uh, in the end, I was then uh, nominated, having more support, I gather, uh, other candidates. Uh, and I had a... Um, long and, and a very interesting tenure on the court. I was there 19 years. Uh, when I arrived, the court had a few cases. By the time I left, it had over 20. Uh, and so I was lucky to be there in a period when, on the whole, the court was involved in many cases and in many significant cases. Judge Schwebel. I noticed that over 19 years you were involved with 29 cases in all, in fact 38 if you count the uh, separate cases of Yugoslavia and NATO. This is a remarkable number. Is this a record, do you know? I don't know, really. Um, the court has had its ups and downs. It was reasonably busy um, from 46 to uh, roughly 66. Uh, then it had a, uh, a great law following its judgment rejecting jurisdiction in the Southwest Africa cases, which was extremely surprising and unpopular. Uh, and it began to revive um, in the early 1980s, but uh, when I arrived at the court in January in '81, there was the Tunisia-Libya case on the docket. There were the remnants of the United States case against Iran for the hostages, in which I was one of the counsel. 
I think that was it. Um, yes, that was all that was on the docket at the moment. There had been an advisory opinion the year before uh, about the removal of the regional headquarters of the World Health Organization, of the World Health Organization from Cairo, and there I was the agent of the United States and, and argued that case before the court. But at any rate, from the time I arrived there were those two cases, then um, the United States and Canada agreed to bring before a chamber of the court a very important dispute between the Gulf of Maine case, which is extraordinarily well argued, an interesting case. And then in the midst of that, Nicaragua brought its famous case against the United States for mining Nicaraguan waters and supporting uh, the Contras. Uh, and that uh, uh, was uh, an event uh, and a very interesting matter. I guess the most challenging uh, case that I dealt with when I was on the court meets the most challenging for me. Though there were others that, that were extremely interesting as well. And in most of these I ended up dissenting. <laughs> Not all, but in most. And I I voted against the United States position in various aspects of the Nicaragua case. Maybe six, seven, eight different aspects. But I, I supported its basic position, which was that it was responding to uh, Nicaraguan Cuban subversion of the uh, government of El Salvador and was in response to that entitled to exert pressures on the Nicaraguan government to stop that uh, support of um, subversion of a neighboring uh, government. Um, uh, another case that I found particularly interesting and, and which I uh, spent a lot of time on my dissenting opinion was the case on whether states uh, may legally use or threaten to use nuclear weapons. And there were others uh, of high interest too. One was the question of jurisdiction as between Bahrain and Qatar in a boundary case, uh, whether the court had jurisdiction, and that turned on whether the parties had really submitted to jurisdiction or not, because they had no general obligation to do so. The question was, had they concluded an agreement which provided they go to the court, and the court sharply split on that. Uh, that was an opinion that I particularly uh, enjoyed. And many others, I was with the uh, majority. Uh, I played a very active role in the administration of the court from the beginning until I resigned from it. You were president of the court? Yes, I was elected vice president in 94 and president in 97. And I enjoyed that experience and I think it went uh, on the whole quite well. The court was extremely busy in that period. Uh, I negotiated with the Dutch government uh, a very marked expansion of the physical plant of the court, uh, the quarters in the Peace Palace. Uh, which I think has materially advanced the capacity of the court to, uh, to function. Uh, and um, uh, I was the um, advocate of giving the court a dining room. Uh, when I arrived at the court, I was surprised to find that first the judges operated in such isolation, not only from the world at large, but from one another. Uh, they didn't gather for meals, they didn't gather for tea. Uh, 
if one judge took a social initiative vis-a-vis -vis another occasionally, that was it. So I tried, first of all, to um, set up a facility by which the judges would not have tea just served in their offices daily, as they were could, uh, but could meet uh, to have tea. Uh, and that attracted maybe a third of the judges for some time, but wasn't a roaring success. There was no dining facility in the Peace Palace except a very modest cafeteria known as the Refectorium and nicknamed the Defectorium or the Infectorium. But it wasn't highly regarded and wasn't very congenial and certainly didn't attract uh, the judges for lunch. At any rate, when I uh, negotiated, advocated and negotiated expansion of the offices of the court, because by then we had so many cases that we had lots of judges ad hoc or appointed by litigants just for the case, and we had a place to house them. That was the impulse for adding offices. I um, advocated as well having a dining room for the court. Uh, to my surprise, at least half the court was indifferent to the idea. Didn't see why, so it would never be used. But we managed to get it established, and it now is a very well regarded, used, and I think useful aspect of the life of the court, because it's a very pleasant facility in the Peace Palace, not only open to the judges, but to others who wish to go as well. But there is a judge's table, a big table, at which the judges, if they're alone, can sit with their colleagues and that results, I think, in a lot of useful exchange, uh, sometimes social, but sometimes substantive. And so in all, uh, I think my years on the court were productive and pleasant ones, but they had their ups and downs. Uh, I had marked differences with uh, some of my colleagues. Uh, I, I think their uh, equality inevitably was variable. But when you consider that the court is an elected body, elected by the UN General Assembly and Security Council, when you consider that it's a highly politicized election, uh, and when you consider the quality of many UN organs, I think the court comes off pretty well. It's uh, on the whole are persons of uh, capacity and integrity. Uh, and this turned out a very creditable body of work. Judge Rebel, more than 50% of your cases were when you were president or vice president. What were the main responsibilities of your role as president? The president <coughs> is a busy man because first... He, he is a judge of the court and must participate in the work of the court. And if there's plenty to do, he's busy on that count alone. Second, uh, every judgment of the court is drafted by a three-member drafting committee, of which the president is a member by reason of his office. Uh, at any rate, if he's in agreement with the majority uh, who's drafting the committee, expresses. Uh, a drafted committee typically is the president and a francophone judge and an anglophone judge of the majority view. Uh, and um, being in the drafting committee uh, is demanding work. Uh, and third, before whatever reaches that stage, one has to participate as a judge does, as I indicated at the outset, not only in reading the pleadings and hearing the case, but in writing a sort of advanced opinion, a so-called note, which sets out your views of the issues, and that's a good deal of work. But then in addition to that, the president presides over all the meetings of the court, both public and, that is, the hearings, and the deliberations of the court. 
Uh, and that's demanding because you've got to be alert during all of that. You can't wool gather, doze, or, or, or do other things. You've got to concentrate on what is going on. And the president has to extract from the debate of the judges uh, a, a, a course forward that will allow it to accomplish what it's there to accomplish. He tries to draw out a consensus what he can. Well, all of that requires um, uh, the application of uh, intellect and energy. Uh, the president um, oversees the work of the registrar who directs the registry, the staff, and there can be not inconsiderable staff problems from time to time. Uh, he represents the court publicly. He goes to the General Assembly and addresses the General Assembly of the UN Annually and presents the, the court. He negotiates the budget of the court uh, each year with the UN. Uh, and that can be a demanding and sometimes even demeaning process. Uh, and um, he's the um, public face of the court in terms of uh, receiving visitors to the court, the various uh, chiefs of state and royalty and so on that come through and visit the court. Uh, he's invited by the Queen to all the state dinners. Uh, and in terms of protocol, uh, outranks uh, all ambassadors in The Hague, uh, except I think that the, uh, uh, the Dean of the Corps. Um, and I think in terms of precedence, uh, maybe a quoted precedence over the Dean of the Corps, I don't quite remember that, but at any rate, I found myself many a time seated uh, next to the uh, the Queen at these uh, dinners and at others given by the Prime Minister. Uh, and so uh, that's a very full plate. And when I was President of the Court, I had an excellent secretary, but that was the total of my assistance. I had no, no law clerk, uh, no executive assistant, no other particular assistance of any kind. Now, happily, that has changed somewhat. Uh, and in that, I played uh, a, a secondary but uh, supportive role. Uh, while I was president, the then dean of New York University Law School, now president of New York University, and a professor at the law school named Brillmeyer, who is now a professor at Yale, uh, proposed that the court have clerks that would be financed by New York University. Because the UN gave the court very little money. I mean, our budget in my time there was about $10 million a year for everything. Uh, less than 1% of the UN's budget, though we're principal organ. Uh, far less than the uh, other tribunals like the Yugoslav Tribunal and so on. And um, the staff was very restricted. And uh, the, while the uh, UN paid for clerks for the Yugoslav Tribunal, there was never any question that they paid for clerks in the International Court of Justice. Well, the proposal of NYU was it would supply five clerks, pay the salaries, transport, <coughs> health benefits, etc., etc., and send us five of different nationalities. Well, I put that to the court, and it turned it down. Uh, there were various suspicions about a proposal from the American Law School, etc., and then the dean of NYU Law School, not easily daunted, sent over his right-hand man and said, we'd like to know what we should propose that the court will accept. So I said, well, why don't you um, send us a list of 15 names, each of a different nationality, uh, of your best students that you think would like a clerkship for a year, and let the court choose those five, not NYU, and we'll see if that was accepted. And that's what they proposed at the court, not by unanimity or with great enthusiasm, the court accepted that. And the year after I left, uh, the academic year after I left, that came into force, 
it had a somewhat rocky start, but after about six months it took hold, and now the court is, or most of the judges of the court, are quite attached to the system of clerks. And the UN has also uh, come in with it, so now a variety of law schools, not only NYU, but a number of law schools from different countries of the world provide clerks, and the UN provides some clerks. And so the, the judges of the court are supported in that way, and certainly the president is, who has a, a, a full-time, highly qualified legal assistant, which ideally would have liked to have had. During this time, Judge Swabel, you produced two important books between 1981 and 2000. And the first one, in 1987, your International Arbitration, Three Salient Problems, has been very well reviewed. Weta calls it a precious and beautifully written book by a distinguished and renowned judge of the International Court of Justice. Weta singles your analysis of the doctrine of severability as the most eloquent, well-documented, and persuasive exposition yet published of a seemingly simple, but in reality, truly complex problem area. Well, that's a very gracious review. Uh, it's a book that I could have never written in my later years on the court, when the court was busy. But as I indicated earlier, when I arrived, it had uh, really one substantial active case on its docket, uh, and it wasn't until 1984 uh, that it came very busy. Uh, well, it happened that uh, in that period, uh, Ellie Lauderpacht uh, decided to begin the Hirsch Lauderpacht Memorial Lecture Series, and he was good enough to invite me to present the first lectures. And I decided to present those three lectures on three topics that uh, had long interested me. Uh, one was, what happens to an arbitral tribunal if one of its members walks out before the judgment is rendered? Uh, that had happened, actually, uh, in a way, at a very early stage of the Anassas case uh, that I had worked on in the 1950s. Uh, there wasn't a walk out there, but the uh, arbitrator appointed by Saudi Arabia died, and there was some question for a time of whether he'd be replaced and whether the tribunal uh, could act in his absence. And so I had been interested in that subject for decades and collected some material on it, but I'd never really written on it. And then another question which had I'd run across in practice was this, that if a state had agreed in a contract or otherwise with an alien, to arbitrate disputes arising between them, and then when a dispute arose, repudiated, repudiated that agreement. Was that a violation of international law? And the third topic I chose to take up is the one that this reviewer has uh, so graciously evaluated, and that is the so-called severability matter, where you have a contract which provides for arbitration of disputes under the contract, and the contract itself is alleged to be invalid or found to be invalid, does that sink the obligation to arbitrate or not? Or does that arbitration survive as a severable uh, obligation and thus enable the arbitral tribunal itself to decide whether the repudiation of the contract was lawful or not, and so forth. And I gave my um, three lectures on that topic, uh, and then I set about uh, amplifying them into what was uh, published, I think, by 1986. But I believe I gave the lectures in 84. It wasn't published as the first in the series, because by that time there had been other lectures and lecturers who were prompter and turning in the uh, manuscript, but eventually it was published. Your other important book in this period was Your Justice in International Law, and this too has received very favourable reviews. Professor James Crawford describes some of your pieces as classics, especially in Part 2 on arbitration. 
Well, that's very kind of Professor Crawford, uh, who was the current Ewell professor and a very distinguished holder of the chair. Uh, that actually, that book is uh, simply a collection of some of the essays and other pieces that I've written uh, over the years, uh, some of which were quite obscurely uh, published and it may be useful to pull together. Um, uh, and actually, um, uh, it's possible that both the second edition of Justice and International Law and of International Arbitration, Three Salient Problems, may see the light of day. I've been discussing those possibilities with the Cambridge University press lately, and I think there's certainly a prospect of that happening. What comes through from the reviews of your books is that what you said sometimes decades ago remains so relevant today. Um, another reviewer has said what an important collection this is. Dixon calls it sparkling and says it's packed with hidden gems. Why is it, Judge Schwabel, that what you wrote has remained so relevant? Well, uh, the, those reviewers are, uh, are very gracious and I guess much of this is in the eye of the beholder and of course some of what I've written um, uh, would today seem uh, quite uh, dated uh, but some of the subjects that have particularly attracted my interest uh, have, have remained um, vital uh, such as the unending disputes about the treatment of foreign investment or about the powers of United Nations organs. Uh, and so um, writing about those subjects uh, may seem to be of uh, continuing uh, interest. Uh, but I wouldn't say for a minute, uh, frankly, that I've been a, uh, a major uh, academic uh, contributor. Uh, I've not been. Uh, if I had pursued an academic career uh, for uh, 50 or 60 years rather than <coughs> essentially for relatively few years, perhaps uh, perhaps uh, I might have been able to make a more substantial academic contribution. Uh, but I've spent uh, most of my uh, uh, years uh, as an international lawyer, uh, as a practitioner in one way or the other, either in private practice or in government, uh, or uh, as a judge or arbitrator. Um, and judges and arbitrators uh, are not academics. They don't, or shouldn't at any rate, deal with problems in the abstract. They deal with a particular dispute. They only deal with what comes to them and they should only uh, write about what the dispute is about and not what they feel like writing about. After your <coughs> time at the International Court of Justice since 2001 you've been involved in various arbitrational roles. Can you say something about some of these? Yes, uh, I've been lucky uh, to be able to continue working since I retired from the court uh, about the age of 70. Uh, one of the attractions of being a lawyer is that uh, one can continue working if one wants to continue working and is not required uh, uh, absolutely to retire as, for example, so many businessmen or doctors uh, or others uh, are. Uh, and um, typically, retired judges become arbitrators, uh, at least in the United States. Uh, that's what great numbers of retired judges do. And I think, uh, of course, there are many fewer 
retired international judges, but I think that's what they do there too. And indeed, uh, uh, in in England, one now sees that uh, retired uh, judges, uh, including retired members of the House of Lords, uh, act as arbitrators. Uh, and that's a very attractive thing to do because one can be engaged in cases of high interest. They may not, for the most part, uh, be as um, important as the work that one may do as a sitting judge, uh, but they're important to the parties uh, uh, and may be uh, uh, quite important uh, uh, in the contributions they make to the development of law in the era. I wouldn't say as important typically as judgments of courts, but still they have a certain importance. Uh, and um, many of these cases are extremely well argued. Uh, and there's a great pleasure in listening to the quality of these arguments uh, and in trying to um, uh, work out uh, what the um, what the law requires in the circumstances. Well, thank you very much, Judge Noble. This is all that remains for me to do, is to thank you again for very kindly agreeing to come and be interviewed for our archive. I'm extremely grateful to you for such a fascinating account of your career in international law. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been a great pleasure. <laughs>